all well this morning as we come to worship together. Welcome to Beulah Presbyterian Church. Um, excited to be here with all of you this morning. We have a, a great worship service planned for you. Pastor Cynthia is away uh, on vacation this week, and so Pastor Bill Sutherland is here to bring us the message this morning. Thank you, Bill. Um, we are going to be doing something different next week at 8.30, so uh, be aware. We are going to be worshiping out in the courtyard, and we do this in summertime occasionally. So what we need to let you know is that Gentlemen, uh, if you could come early at 8 o'clock and help our, our men folk to uh, get chairs out there for us to sit in, um, we would really appreciate your help that morning. And if you are not an early person, um, we could use your help coming with bringing the chairs back into our fellowship hall. So uh, please join us. It'll be a really wonderful service outside. Um, we've always enjoyed that particular service. So come and help and, um, and come and worship with us. Uh, we have several announcements this morning, and first, a big thank you to everyone who helped with Vacation Bible School, whether you were in the preparation mode or you were leading and teaching and walking with children. We had a lovely group of children here this past week. You'll see we left some of the decorations up just for a festive environment this week, so uh, we thank you for that. We had a great uh, closing program in here for the first time. We moved the chairs in the front here, and the children joined their parents in a sing-along and a move-along using our projection system, which we've never been able to do before for Vacation Bible School. So it was a wonderful time, and we really enjoyed it. Thank you, everyone, for that. Um, I, have, I, think, I think Kelly also planned some of the music, I think, today that you'll hear a little bit. So... Uh, Hopefully, you'll, you'll get a little bit of taste of Vacation Bible School as well. In the coming weeks, um, Saturday, July 28th, Pastor Cynthia is having one of her prayer, learning to pray for others workshops. This is a, uh, a kind of a repeat of one that was in the spring, and many people said, oh, I can't make that one in the spring. She's having it again, Saturday, July 28th in the morning um, from 9 until about 1. And um, please come and take advantage of that. I know I was at the first one. Gave us lots of ways and things to think about when we're praying for others. So if you would like to be a part of that, you can talk to me after the service or give Lucinda a call in the office during the week from Monday through Thursday, and she will sign you up for that, okay? Um, today, the youth are going, in the exceptional friends, are going to the baseball game um, right after the 11 o'clock service. Alex says he has a few extra tickets. If anybody is interested in going, please see him after the service, and he'll make sure that um, you get your ticket and are able to join them. Um, we have some sad news to report, the death of Pauline Obanoff on Saturday, and um, I... I understand that she has um, Ed, her husband, who was caring for her, as well as four sons that we want to keep in our thoughts and our prayers this week. There is a visitation at Wolf Funeral Home on Monday from 2 to 4 and 6 to 8, and then the funeral service will be there at 11 a.m. on Tuesday. Um, this morning, um, this is one of our Sundays that we have a generosity moment. This is a time for us to share with you some of the wonderful ministry that's going on here at Beulah. And so today we are highlighting our caring ministry. And so I'm going to invite Diane Dagelman and Ken Waddell up to talk about a few of our caring ministries that um, we have ongoing here. And you'll notice in your bulletin that we always highlight the budget area of the ministries we're talking about so that you're understanding where um, things are going and coming from in our budget that supports these kind of ministries. Um, so please pay attention to that as well as other announcements. And Diane? I'm here about the Beulah Prayer Shawl Ministry. The Beulah Prayer Shawl Ministry has achieved a milestone. We have created over 500 prayer shawls and distributed the same amount. Now, there be, may be more than that, but in the beginning, there were no records kept. But since we've been keeping records, it's been over 500. 
Uh, these prayer shawls have been created to comfort those experiencing grief, illness, and other overwhelming issues in their lives or the lives of loved ones. This ministry is available to our congregation and others. The prayer shawl ministry was the vision of Judy Bryson and Betty McGee in 2009. We have also donated scarves of uh, comfort to a shelter for abused women and their families. We have also knitted baby blankets that went to Haiti. And uh, I think the baby blankets used there are not used in the same uh, concept what we use them here. They're put on the dirt ground and used more as mats to put the baby on, to change diapers on, whatever needs to be done. Uh, our participants, past and present, include Marie Bear, Judy Bryson, Stath Stacy Etherson, Esther Gass, Mary Hamlin, Hamilton, Helen Sinai, Betty McGee, Peggy Parsons, Phyllis Rinsma, Judy Schaefer, Holly Shiroki, Mary Lou Snodgrass, Joan Sutter Anderson, Ann Urich, and Tori Zido. If you are in need of a prayer shawl for someone that is in need, you can contact myself or Judy Schaefer. Uh, we meet on the second Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. in the Fireside Room. Um, if you want to learn to knit, we've got some. Marie Bear is our expert knitter, and so come and learn. We we are we do do that. Um, a few a few years ago, um, I gave my aunt a prayer shawl uh, for her daughter, my cousin, who had breast cancer. And after um, I gave it to her, and I just put it in a bag for her, and uh, knowing my aunt, she had to pull it out and look at it. And she said she immediately felt warmth coming from that. And we have heard this from so many different people that when they receive them, they feel warmth. And that uh, is just overwhelming to me. And another one of the early prayer shawl recipients said that um, she took her prayer, when she did her morning devotions and her prayers, she always took her prayer shawl with her. She really used it in the sense that it was meant for. And I'd like to read a few, a few of the um, thank you cards and I'll just take bits and pieces, but it says, thank you to all my Bueller sisters on the prayer shawl ministry. I feel your love and support and prayers. Every day is a gift. I will read the scriptures of comfort and hope and ask now and know now that I am not alone. And again, so many of them talk about the warmth Dear friends, I really appreciate the lovely prayer shawl. It is a comfort and a covering to me, and it helps me to feel God's love, presence, and healing power. In addition, it helps to visualize others for whom I may be praying, being covered by his love as well. And we also, we have these scriptures of comfort at home, but we also have a, a card that goes with us, and I'll read that. This shawl was made for you to bring comfort to know you are loved. This shawl is to wrap you up when you are cold, when you are hurting, and when you need to snuggle. This shawl was made with blessings, with love, and with prayers. Prayer Shaw Ministry, Beulah Presbyterian Church. Thank you. Uh, what I'm gonna speak about today is the Caring Card Ministry. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Caring Card Ministry, one of the many ministries of the Board of Deacons. The Deacons Caring Card Ministry has teams of two people. What we do is to send cards to the prayer families and homebound families each week that are listed in our weekly bulletins. We also try to send cards to families that are on the prayer list 
emailed out by Nora Getz. In addition, we send cards to our homebound members during the holidays. We also send thank you, encouragement, get well, and sympathy cards. Just a couple examples how this ministry touches some of our hearts. One of our exceptional friends received a card from one of our deacons, and he was in such joy that he brought the card to church and was waving it around and showing people what he received. What a joy that was to him and probably to his family as well. Just recently, one of our members and fellow deacon, Ginger Bauer, and her husband, Buddy, received cards, and she expressed what an uplifting experience it was not only to receive a card, but that her church family was praying for her and Buddy, too. I just want to say that the Caring Card Ministry does not only have to be a deacon function, it can be one that you may find gratitude in doing. Some other ideas, if you notice that one of your fellow church members is not at church for a couple of weeks, reach out to them and send a card. My wife Linda helps me sending out cards when it's my turn on the deacon list. And an idea that she has also, not just at the prayer families, but she sends cards to some people she looks in the directory that she might have not seen. So in closing, you never know how someone might really feel in receiving a card. Give it a try. It also has a be fulfilling to you. Thank you and have a blessed day. As we gather to express our love and thankfulness to God this morning, we come knowing that he's our strength when we cannot stand on our own and that he's our salvation because we could have never earned that. So will you stand with me because his grace has changed the course of all lives for all time. And that's why we worship him. Let's lift up a song.
going to sing You Give Life. Worshiping you makes us feel alive. Even when it's hard to say those words, even when stuff is really going wrong and we're met with trials that we never thought we would be met with, God, when we come before you, you put everything in its place and you're first again where you should have been all along and all week. So God, thank you for this time that we get to just express all the bubbly feelings we've been having all week, everything that's just been coming at us, we get to come now before you. We thank you for that, God. Thank you for this church that stands. Thank you for this church that sings. We love you, God. Amen. Would you have a seat? We're going to come into a time of confession, and during that time, we'll um, have some quiet, and I just encourage you to really go there. You know, Don't be distracted by your chipped nail polish or by... Um, the things you got to do today. Just don't go there. Close your eyes. Go into your little place. Let's pray. God, keep our eyes fixed on you. 
you know us so well. You know that we tiptoe and you know that we waver and that we're lukewarm and bland at best sometimes. We walk this walk and we want to be known only as your followers, radical and changed, but God, we meander and we wander. Hear us today, God, as we come before you silently, our words to your ears, our hearts to your will. Lord, we thank you for taking us through trials that add heat to our faith. Remind us, God, when we doubt, remind us when we wonder that you have called to us, each one of us. It's no mistake that each person is here today, God. You called it. You planned it. You ran after them even when they were running the opposite direction. God, thank you that you never stop. Our assurance comes from 2 Timothy um, chapter 1, verse 9, and it says, He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for today. God, speak through Carolyn. Speak through Bill. Let us hear the words you have to say. Amen. I have a remarkable computer. It almost gives me advice sometimes. But I have a love-hate relationship with it, too. By the way, I have one of those prayer shawls. My favorite color is green. After Nancy died, and my hair is getting silvery. So Ruth Rudder made me one of green and silver. And every time I put that thing on, you know, you just, you just, you feel something when you physically put it on. Anyway, my computer decided that I need a font size 16 this morning instead of 14. And I'm the bifocals, but these are unusual too. And my optician said, what do you want? I said, I have, I don't want trifocals. My up near version my vision is going out as I get older. That's crazy, but it's working. Then the laptop's about here, and then the distance is there, but the laptop is just right for preaching and handbell ringing so I can see the notes and pay attention to Bill when he's giving advice. Because one was in focus and the other wasn't. Our scripture this morning is kind of interesting. And, uh, well, we might as well take the Hebrews text first. I don't know where it is in your scripture, but uh, it's kind of a, the British term is touchy. He's kind of, he's a little bit irritated, you know? Here these people have been there for a long time and the contemporary things, they just didn't get it or didn't get it too well the first time. And the word he uses there is, uh, if I were to put it in slang, when it says that uh, you're dull, it's about three degrees above zombie, somewhere in that range. About this, we have much to say, which is hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For Though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of God's word. You need milk, not solid food, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a child, and that's a little bitty child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their faculties trained by the practice of distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from the dead works and the faith toward God. With the instruction about ablution, laying out of hands, resurrecting the dead, eternal judgment, for this will do if God permits. For it is impossible to restore again to repentance those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, 
if they then commit apostasies, he was, he's, he's telling you, I don't think we have many uh, people in apostasy today. Nothing that shows much. Since they crucify the Son of God on their own account and hold him up to contempt. For land which has, land which has drunk the rain that often falls upon it and brings forth vegetation useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated, receives a blessing from God. But a bear of thorns and thistles is worthless, near to being accursed. Well, that's not a very happy scripture, so let's go get something. In Ephesians. Yeah, it's in the middle, y'all. Now, the thing was that Jesus descended, ascended, and uh, he gifted the church. He gifted the church. He who descended and he who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And his gifts were that some should be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity of the faith in God and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature humanhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. The, 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 the word of the Lord. I guess the sermon comes now, right? Okay. You didn't know? It kind of flows. <clears throat> I decided I was going to do a different kind of sermon this morning, and it's called a symphonic sermon. In a symphonic sermon, you set out a theme, so like a da 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 da, and then you work the melody around, and it comes different ways. When we get to movement three, I put it in a minor key a little bit. Here's the theme. Unless our faith helps us develop into Christian maturity, we had better reevaluate it until our beliefs stimulate our actions. They have to go together. And we could take off on that. There it is. Unless our faith helps us develop into Christian maturity, we had better reevaluate it until our beliefs stimulate our actions. How many worship services do you think that you have experienced in your lifetime so far? How many hymns do you think you've sung over the years? Prayers prayed, private ones included, sermons heard, Sunday school classes, young and older, during your life? And how many of you have Bibles or read them? Commentaries, in-depth theology books, DVDs thus far. For so some of us who are in middle age, but I'm well into that, it would probably almost be in the thousands. You younger people haven't been around long enough to experience that many of them. We add up all that experience. That's a lot of hours, days, weeks, months, years. The prior of the uh, Hebrew letters probably had similar thoughts about that. And that's why what I just read in that rather annoying fifth chapter. Now, the writer of Hebrews came along and wrote that somewhere after the collapse and the, uh, the Romans had destroyed Rome. And that was a horrible thing to experience. And he looked at that, and he was beginning, you know, how much of the faith is going to survive this? And that mixture, he was also Greek, Greek and Hebrew, both. And that makes it kind of difficult to understand this book until you understand something about Greek thinking and Hebrew thinking. Because we're not familiar with some of those customs back then. And if you don't know those customs back then, for instance, you will never understand some of the parables of Jesus. You simply won't until you know that culture. So let's explain briefly the difference between the two, Greek and the Hebrew. Greeks followed the philosopher Plato. It was a lot in the mind. The mind, the mind, the mind. To be is to, th to think is to be that important. 
and they were idealists. That's a rich field in philosophy. They believed that somewhere, but who knows where, there's a perfect pattern for almost everything. But our present life that we live is imperfect. It's an imperfect copy. That's all it ever will be. It is impossible to achieve perfection during this life. And so you, you kind of, there's a kind of a hidden melancholy there. Yeah, gee, you can't get anywhere near it. See, it's, it's just thinking. And then they had to struggle with, can virtue be taught? And they thought they could do it intellectually. Well, all these syllogisms and paradigms and logical chains of thought. Well, life is more than just thinking logically or mathematic equations. And so they almost gave up. Hebrew thinking is different, very different, because the Hebrews believed somewhere, someone is surrounding us mysteriously is also sustaining us. The mind, ah, but the heart, see, the heart. The Hebrews thought about the heart, lave, heart. That's, that one word, lave, describes almost your whole being. Your mind and heart, both. And uh, they also thought that whatever that is, or whomever that is, it's mysterious. And you better be careful how you approach that. It can be uh, very risky. You don't get too close to that hot, holy stuff. Jacob wrestled with that angel or that man for a long time. He discovered that he, amazingly, after that long struggle, he was still alive. He survived it. He got that close to holiness, and he survived it. And that's why, in Genesis 32, so Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my light is preserved. He lived to tell about it. See? Not a temple when it was there, it was a holy place. You notice that the chancel's raised up here. There's the ground level. And this in the temple would be a very holy, holy, holy place. I wouldn't have my banjo up there and I wouldn't be walking around up there and the choir wouldn't be sitting there either. The holy of holies. The high priest once a year entered there. That was a day, Yom Kippur, the day of, the day of atonement. And he didn't stay in there too long either because he had to get out of there. He did his ritual and the nation was forgiven, out. Why do we call it the Holy Land? Why do we still call it the Holy Land? It's holy for three of the world's faiths. I had an elder who went for a, once there for a tour and the guide, that's the El Aqsa Mosque, is the dome on top of the, where the temple was. And some people wanted to look around. He said, duh, duh. don't go anywhere behind there. Don't go underneath there. There might be stairs. Don't go down there. Mere human beings have no business down there. And he wouldn't let them go down. In the light of that, the writer of Hebrews combined theological argument for the finality of salvation achieved by Christ, repeating exhortations to those of faith and practice we're weakening. All that made him think. He was uh, kind of annoyed about that. Remember now, he, he looked at destroyed Jerusalem, and Greek was the universal language that time after Alexander the Great. So it was Greek, Hebrew, all these things. Nobody reaches perfection. But the gospel of Christ has been believed and sustains us the writer of Hebrews was firmly, con firmly convinced of that, but he saw that weakening. He said, so that's why the annoyance and the urgency. And he talked about teaching and learning. And he said, all you keep doing is going again and again and again, repeating, endlessly repeating what you already know. Do you ever think of thinking something new? 
We're experiencing something new. Don't tell anybody I told you this, but I met some clergy that are like that. They haven't read a book on theology in 20 years. And they repeat things and they go through the little Presbyterian USA franchise, and that's all they look at. Doesn't it sound a little bit familiar to our time? It should. Look at the decline of Christian faith in the Western world, in the church in general, Presbyterian church. It isn't pleasant to watch, is it? I don't like it. Now I could ask you a question. Think about it. Are you bored with your faith? You come here week after week, month after month, year after year. Are you bored with your faith? That's not an insult, by the way. Remember something. It takes time to learn the faith. It takes time to learn the faith and the breadth and the depth. What we're talking about in our Christian faith is a meaningful journey, not just a lecture or a sermon every week. Our lives have to be lived out theologically. It's more than a dull routine, or it should be, and a series of theological propositions to be mastered. So what? I used to say that when I was here on staff and I was pushed into another graduate program, an answer, not another one. But uh, I finished it. But it wasn't just things to be mastered. It was an educational walk and something I could use later. Our Christian faith is formidable, formidable, powerful faith with a rich tradition. If you just read a book about it or look at the artwork, it has transformed the Western world. I was, uh, yeah, I'll put this illustration in. My urologist is a Christian, and he reads theology. And I thought, if I told this story in the seminary, they wouldn't believe it. You know, you have to strip down for the exam he's going to do. And here I am, sitting on the edge of an examining table, stripped down, and we are talking about the theology of John Calvin. <laughs> they wouldn't believe it. Okay, the gospel leaves a deep imprint once it's been accepted. Christ and his presence endure. Art, literature, music, sculpture, theology, which can hold its own in the world of ideas. One philosophy professor at Pitt said, John Calvin was a very smart man. He can still hold his own in the world of ideas. He said the Thomists are kind of walking away. But Calvin is still there, and Reformed theology is still there. I was sitting there, and, yeah, yeah, tell him, tell him, Prof. You can search human endeavor wherever you want to and find riches in abundance because Christ, Christ and the Christian faith have had a very, very vast influence in history. Now, on to Paul. Paul's letter to the Ephesians blends the incarnation of Christ and the perfect pattern. He puts the two together. There was the Greek model that we can experience in our lifetime, as well as what the church and discipline and us, the apostles knew that firsthand. We wish we could. We can. Paul exhorts the saints, we must no longer be children tossed to and fro, be blown about by every wind of doctrine. And our age is flooded with doctrines. Doctrines covering such thing as how to get rich, the doctrine of how to get rich, or how to hide the aging look. The next one, well, may be how to put some sparkle in your spiritual life or something. And we might even see the book someday, Horrors, Christian Theology for Dummies. I'm waiting for that one. But these are all substitutions. They don't satisfy our deepest needs, and they keep going back to these things and getting rich at it. We desire what we really desire, don't we, are healthy identities, a healthy identity. Community environments of support. 
with that prayer shell, when you put it on, that's part of that support. Integrity in our efforts on a larger view of the world that has hope in it. The Christian church wants to be one of the primary institutions that provide all those unique things. We are a unique society of people. And I mean that far in a better sense. We are a unique society society of people, and you're part of it, that can do for this world what it needs, unlike any other institution. We have charming gurus, I know, fortune tellers, astrology, and the karma doctrine, alias luck, are not the same as what we do here. Because Christ gave gifts to the church, to the Holy Spirit. No one else can make that claim. Paul listed five of them. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now, if you go back to 1 Corinthians 12, which is right next to 1 Corinthians 13, there are nine of them listed there. And he is saying, in essence, you don't need all those nine gifts. All you need are the five, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And if I'm asked to preach again, maybe a year from now, I'd like to unpack that for you. You'd be amazed what is in there, amazed. To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. Boy, that, that's another sermon. Cynthia can go away for a weekend. Then he adds, but speaking the truth in love. There's a whole concept there. Grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together. That's a, that's a uh, medical term, where the body is, the joints are going back together. Every ligament which it is equipped, each part with working properly, promotes the body's growth of upbuilding itself. And there's that word again, upbuilding ourselves in love. In love. That is how we get our beliefs to stimulate our actions. You can't teach it, you have to live it. There's that Greek perfect pattern again, hmm? The contact with the holy, there's Christ, incarnation of the body, the measure of full stature, the mature adult. This is not infant's work, where an infant is breastfeeding with its mother. This is adult's work. It is adult's work. It is eating solid food. It is being nourished by scripture. It is in prayer, worship together, letting the Holy Spirit guide us together and sharing the faith with others. It is also a joy of being part of the body of Christ, upbuilding itself in love. Boy, that's not boring. How is that going to be boring? That can't be boring. How would you like to know that you're really loved by the people out here, by the Spirit of God and Christ? When you would put all those things together, boy, what a world and life view that is. Nothing else can match that. Can't come close. Now, when you leave here this morning, I promise, if I could exact a promise from you, I would ask you to read the Ephesian chapter three times, at least three times this week, all the way through, three times, and meditate on it, and walk into it as if you were there with people doing those things and being surrounded with love as that is. And let you feel it. Let your feelings go. Boy, wouldn't that be wonderful? And let your feelings and your thoughts flow into that passage, and it will connect you to that. There's no other way will. And let yourself feel it in our time. That's then, this is now. We can know this and live this now. And by the grace of God, we will find this together, even at Beulah Church. Amen. Thank you, Bill. Um, 
lots of sermons in there. I'm, I'm going to have to listen to the recording and take notes. Um, we're going to respond um, with the song Oceans. It, it applies um, easily today. Um, God is more concerned with our spiritual growth than our comfort zones, in case you haven't noticed. <laughs> Um, so, you know, when we go deeper and we go wider, that's usually when you, you feel the heat, right? Things start happening and you're like, wow, I must be doing something right because attacks are coming and stuff is hard. Um, but when you're plugged in, you know, it, those trials don't make you bump down a couple notches. They bring you up. So we're going we're gonna to sing this awesome song today. And it, it is a request for God to take us there. So don't sing it unless you mean it because... God will. He will hear you say, I'm ready. I'm going to take that step. So let's stand. Um, the beautiful Sam is going to lead us in this song. And uh, let's go. is without borders. That's big. Let's sing it. Faith will be me. 
I'm going to open us up in a word of prayer, and then you may uh, pray silently or out loud. Please bow your heads and pray with me. Dear Father, um, we pray for our church and that we will shine your light and do everything to glorify you. We pray for Bill Kem, Bem, and Patrick Morgan. We pray for our country and all the violence that's going on all around the world. We pray for our leaders in the world, Lord, that you would guide them. Lord, hear each and every one of our prayers, all for the sake of your Son, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not to temptation. Deliver us from evil. That is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We will now collect the morning offering. You're welcome to stand. You're welcome to clap. Follow Mary. She's almost on the beat.
I hope that this has been a time of insights, a time of blessing, a time of rethinking, a time of strengthening, a time of sharing. And now may grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit sustain us now and forever. Amen.